association event between Austin and Quinn. So, um, before I introduce both of the speakers and artists today, I just want to say a little bit about what this talk is for, what it's part of, and what the overall project is about. So, I know a number of you were present, present is the right word to use, at um, Austin's amazing 24 hour performance, Imperial Lunatic, on Saturday. Um, at various points throughout the day um, and that is part of his exhibition which is at the Art Centre which you can view on the 13th of May. Um, our conversations around what this project exhibition would be from the outset approximately two years ago I think we started discussing it always included a an interest in this space in the chapel, which we now officially call Stack Chapel. At that point, it was to become part of the Arts Centre. We didn't know when, everything was on hold with COVID, but it was something that was informing Austin's practice and was very much part of his thinking around what would inform the exhibition as a whole. And as part of that, we worked on and proposed the idea of a residency so that the performance you saw on Saturday was a result of a prolonged period of time engaging with the space, with the history of the space, and with, I suppose, the nuts and bolts of the building itself and what it feels like to be in here. Um, I'm going to point out the drawing at the back of the room, which you probably didn't, you might not have seen the day of the performance because it was quite dark. Interestingly, Austin created that piece while on a residency in Italy, thinking about here, but not realizing that the colors are exactly the same as the colors on the wall. The gold on the mouth is the same as the trim, like the colors are, specific, are exactly the same, very subconsciously created. So it just goes to show, I think, the depth of the engagement with the space from quite a time ago. So the conversation today will look at ideas of residency. Fergus is very also very engaged with residencies and how that becomes part of an artistic process and how it's really important to developing artistic work throughout your career and getting new and engaging ideas. So before I hand over, I will read, of course you have to read the bios, I can't remember them all. So Asma Quinn, on my right, is an award-winning visual artist and performance expert living and working in Sarge Prairie. He has had several solo exhibitions at Project Art Centre Dublin, Butler Gallery Kilkenny, and David Cunningham Projects San Francisco. Most recently, he had an exhibition at Source and Thurlis in 2021, and then obviously the exhibition at the Secretary Art Centre this year. His work is collected by the Arts Council and many public and private collections in the Ireland and USA. Fergus Okabor, on my left, is an independent choreographer and dance artist who works across different media, including film and live performances, and frameworks for audiences and artists to build communities together. Fergus has performed with companies such as Adventures in Motion Pictures, Catapult Dance Company, Claire Ross Ensemble, and Art Dance Company, among others. From 2018 to 2020, he was artistic <coughs> director of the National Dance Company of Wales. He is a founding associate artist at Project Arts Centre and is deputy chair of the Arts Council of Ireland. We'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the Arts Council of Ireland who did support this project, especially the whole entire um, exhibition and its work with Austin, both from the point of view of the Arts Centre and also from um, Austin's own artistic practice, and also supported by Tipperary County Council. Without any further ado, now that that's all done, I will hand you over to Austin and Fergus. Enjoy the conversation. <laughs> Thanks, Camila, and um, thank you for your support and, um, and the Arts Council, particularly personally as well. But um, yeah, being supported and being trusted um, is so important, and it's, that's how work gets made, really. And, and particularly in the context of a residency, is a very heightened. Uh, period of trust, I would say, where um, we are given um, space without expectation. So um, it, it definitely contributed to the making of this work, which was at this site right here, where we are sitting, um, of the Imperial Lunatic 
performance. So today uh, I'm delighted to be in conversation with Fergus. Tell us your, some of your story. Um, and I suppose this is for me is in the context of the residency. I would love to talk to you about residencies, um, about space, spaces and places where you have had residencies, and this, this being one of them, and uh, performed. We'll talk. I'm always interested in processes like how work gets made. And particularly in the context of residents. For me, that I have done, I have done many, but the few that I've done have been very important. That they've generated bodies of work that might last many eight years. So um, the processes, and I'm also always really interested in who you look at, who are your influences, and um, I'd like to share some influences. But if Things that are, the people, our other artists who influence how we think and how we move, and uh, why we want. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'm interested in. Thank you. 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 Horizons. What is your ambition? Uh, personally, in, professionally, uh, emotionally. Uh, because I think, as well, a residency opens horizons uh, that, that you can't see when you're in your own territory. It's like a different territorial experience of this new horizons appear. So for me it gives the freedom to look in a different way and look in different directions maybe, you know. So they're the kind of things I'd like to talk about. And uh, but but to start right here, you know, where we were, you well the last time I met you was in a church in Limerick. At the time where you were performing recently with Isabel Rothermander. Um, and I'd love to hear more about that work that you're doing with Isabel on sanctuary. Uh, but I had a phone call with you before that performance to discuss today. And you said, well, I'm in another church now because you were rehearsing in one church, but you're going to be performing in St. John's in Limerick. That's Limerick's it's home. And, uh, Previous to that, I was here in October 21, welcome to Prairie Dance and uh, Sunday morning meeting here. Uh, uh, and I knew you were going to be here, but I'd never seen you before. I had actually seen you before, once before, in that important. Yeah, on a very early you were, that was a residency, that's right, with our friend Bernadette Cotter. So that's where we've been meeting, really. very briefly, and having these encounters where our bodies are centered and time is arrested. So this Sunday morning, where we were in this space, we'll just talk about this chapel. Um, you did a piece uh, that was very, very moving for me. Um, completely occupied this space, which I was not, I was not familiar with reading. Really. I've been in here once, maybe in Junction um, Festival. Um, but just again to talk about the chapels that we find ourselves in. Um, thinking about these chapels as art spaces, as sanctuaries. Um, as places of power, and places of vocation, uh, refuge, mystery, ritual, uh, oppression, 
uh, ecstasy and, uh, and hope. And so many of these chapels and churches are being used as art spaces around the country. So that's interesting to me. We keep finding our way back in here. And I was here the other day in creating this piece, and which had a lot of those elements, I think. Um, certainly it was ritualistic. And it was repetitive. So this was the third thing that interests me in dance as well. It's repetition and difference. Uh, so that piece, that morning here, it was about 25 minutes long. There was some sound I don't really remember. Um, but you said it was the first time you performed in a while. Was it, was, if it was 21, it was just post pandemic, and we were starting to produce life a bit maybe. So, let's talk a bit about that first. Oh, hi, can you hear? Can you hear me? If I talk like this? Yeah, I really remember it. That um, the piece which at the time I called Unreeling, a solo. Um, and it was, it really did feel out of the pandemic, but not only out of the pandemic, I had been um, artistic director of a national dance company in Wales for two years, 2018 to 2020. And that role had meant a lot of responsibility, but kind of taking me away from a dance practice, my own dancing. And ultimately I stopped that because for me, coming away from the dance practice felt like I was like a cut flower, um, so like I could do things and you put me in a vase, but ultimately the flower is not going to be able to survive very long, it's going to fade. And I stopped that job because I knew I needed to connect to the roots, connect to, my, to the energy of performing again. I didn't expect the whole world to have to stop in 2020. Like, literally, my, my contract finished, I think, on the 17th of March, 2020, which was when the UK went into lockdown. So it was very, like, dramatic. Um, and there was a period of, like, going inwards, reflecting. But one of the first things that I was able to do coming out of the pandemic, partly because of this... The pandemic, we didn't all experience the same way. Ireland had a different phase. The UK, where I live, I live in London, and then France. I went and did a residency at the Irish Cultural Centre in Paris. And pa France was in also in a slightly different phase or how they were responding to kind of lockdown restrictions. I was able to go there um, and do a residency. And I, out of that residency, started to be that work. I remember that that work is very much about circles. It's about being in a place and the lines of energy that um, both come from far away and kind of land in this place, and also the lines of energy that you can send out. And I remember, so I'd made it, I was invited to the Prairie Dance Platform, and then we came here to perform it. And then suddenly I realized, oh, it's a church. I know a church. I, as someone who didn't start dancing until I was 23, so late, in some ways I haven't had a, the same kind of dance training as someone who might have been dancing from very young. But all of us in Ireland have had our bodies formed, trained. And my training has been by sport and by religion, by Catholicism in particular, and I guess one of the shared things we have is uh, we went to uh, the same boarding school. In Tipperary. In Tipperary, in CCR, in Roscoe, Cistercian College, Ross Gray. And I trained as an altar boy. I trained to know when to stand and when to sit and when to kneel and when to ring the bell, all of those sort of things. That's training. And whether it, you call it dance training or not, it trains how this body kind of knows how to be. And there are lots of things, particularly as a kind of queer body, that means that that environment was not positive. However, it's funny, when you go to France or Germany, where there's sort of big industrial histories, 
when you go to those art spaces that were formerly big factories or whatever, like these huge spaces, we don't really have those spaces, apart from Art in Prussia or something like that. This is the kind of biggest architecture that most of us will have experienced if we're like whatever religious background. Big buildings. And when I would come into a church, even as a child, there's something about this architecture that's designed to make us look upwards, that has a bit of space, that actually makes my body feel some possibilities. Now, I know that the architecture is like, it's pretty defined. We're all supposed to face that direction. There's probably a narrow line. There's a narrow line where you're able to kind of like carefully in this amount of space kneel and then kind of carefully get up. It's not a big generous space. Our bodies are organized. But as an altar boy, when I would come early to the church, I could have free reign in this big space. Mm. And in Ross Gray, like when everything about our lives was organized as students, I would always be looking for those opportunities to roam the corridors when there weren't like 400 other people there so that my body could feel space and joy. Mm. And if we think back to that moment of when I, and I, I was back there waiting to come and perform and I saw you there and I was really moved because I, Suddenly, I remembered that this route through Clonmel, I grew up in Waterford, went to Ross Gray. So coming to boarding school, we would be driving this way. I know this, I know this route. And suddenly seeing Austin, I remembered that my body's been through here. My body has a history of traveling through this space. And also we have a shared body that is somehow related to this religious, but also kind of militarized as in very regimented environment. Mm -hmm. And I remember it made my performance that day something that I'd made in Paris. Interestingly, CCI is also a former religious um, space and military space. It's been both of those things in its mm. history. Um, it made me understand what some of the energy that was already in there, it kind of gave it a particular expression. And I felt mm. a lot of joy. I felt a lot mm. of joy performing in that space and knowing that I was allowed to dance here. Mm. Uh, it was certainly a moment uh, for me too of liberation, I would say, of liberating our histories through your performance and in my small way by attending the performance and trying to just give you any energy I could. And also, um, you know, just being very present in this space with this, this lovely light actually that morning. Um, on this road, you said, I uh, didn't meet you. We only had four sentences, I think. And afterwards, because you were so busy meeting everybody, um, but, you, that's what you said, I've been on this road many times. That struck me as very poetic also, you know, that we have been on this road, this route, you know, through performance, through our bodies and through our histories, um, tangentially, but we haven't met until that moment. Yeah. Even though we both, we were just the year be after me. And so we had our shared history in school would have been in the art, the art room yeah. and music and um, music class and any alternative activity we could find and do excellently that would get us away from the regime. Yeah. Um, that was our route out, wasn't it? And, and just towards, towards that sideways way that we needed to needed to travel. I also came to performance and using my own body much later, not, not, not as far along as you, but maybe, maybe not so much. As in college, there was no such thing. In art college, um, it was never mentioned, performance art. Um, and in reality, I think I would have seen Nigel Rolfe perform uh, in Cork, in the Triscoll. Um, he was active. And he was so unusual, and he was he was performance, you know, in 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 the south of Ireland, anyway, the Republic, and Alistair McLennan in the north, of course. 
And then it was other people, you know, um, abroad. But I had no understanding of performance or uh, what it was, really, until later. So um, in that way, uh, it wasn't just something I learned, you know, in college and went on. Much like you, 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 you went to Oxford, but then you started going to dance classes at night kind of thing, and under cover of darkness, you started finding your... Yeah, I mean, I... Root. I loved dancing, and I was going to ask you about that. Like, I think I did love dancing. I grew up in the Gulf of the Ring. We had Kayleys. I liked that. Um, I, we had operettas in Ross Gray, and we had little choreographies that went with that. But, like... No, I didn't do Irish dancing. I didn't do, I had no, I had no kind of training. Mm. I remember learning Thriller when, when there was, when a, the Atlanta Olympics were on. And for the first time, like young people won't realize, but like TV didn't start till the afternoon. And for the, the Atlanta Olympics, because it was on early in the morning, they had a sort of morning show. And as part of the morning show, over a few days, they, thought, they taught the choreography of Thriller. And I, as a teenager, was like learning that. I was like, I have to. I mean, I guess it's sort of like a broadcast TikTok. Um, and I had, to, I had to learn that. So I knew I really enjoyed it. But there was, there was no mm. way to think about that as a kind of way of expression. And it was to, through doing drama, through doing plays, and then a musical, mm. and a musical with some movement, that the dancing came. And as soon as I was dancing, I knew that that... I knew that that consumed me, mm. and I wanted to do it. I was wondering for you, we'll say given that we were, again, like in secondary school, a lot of sports, the, mm -hmm. the body was kind of channeled in a particular way, and that didn't ignite for us, that, that wasn't, but, no. and, and people would sort of say, oh, you're not physical, like that, you're not physical, when in fact, we were just waiting for the opportunity mm. to be like as physical as we could be. Mm -hmm. And I feel that in many different ways, mm. that somehow the options off offered to us, um, like I think all of us have this appetite to live and explore our bodily possibilities. It's just, we have to find the ones that are going to make sense for us. And mm -hmm. for everyone, it's not gonna be yoga or kamogi or, rugby no. or whatever, like Ross. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is performance. How did it, how yeah. did you know that it was the find your way to that it's a great. It's a great question. Uh, let me see. I suppose, um, I suppose through looking at some, one or two other artists that I'd come across who I would consider like image makers and, um, and that also use their bodies to make an image. So from my, my route into live art performance was through artists, particularly someone like Joan Jonas, who makes sculpture and occasionally then uses her own on installations and occasionally would use herself in order to make something else and makes that into a piece of work or, you know, holds pieces making, holding mirrors, you know, um, where that's the, that's the artwork. So it was, it was that you could use your own body to make a piece, but also that, that that's the only way that that piece can be made. It cannot be made in any other way. I can't do a painting of me with a white moon. It's not going to work. I didn't even do a drawing of it. It can only happen in real time and space, live. And I think mostly, unusually, with this exhibition, which is at the Art Centre, South Berry Art Centre, of paintings and sculpture, Often I've done, the, you know, an installation and then made a piece as a live art piece and then left that piece in the space as a, as an, as a work. The evidence of the energy. For me, I think it's energy. And um, the energy in a painting or a drawing, the energy that's coming off a piece of work, and that, it's, uh, that, that when, it's, when you're using yourself, your body live, it's, it's, it's so exciting. And it's... Um, it's, uh, yeah, as I say, it's, it's, there's only one way to make this image. So for me, I'm trained as a painter. Um, 
And so I, I, only, I really only know about making images. So every single image in this long performance, I think I said it to Helena about halfway through, I said it's, the only thing that's tiring is just giving images all the time. You know, it's like creating something new all the time. And the last image, like this image of the shoulder, I didn't use until the very end. It's like it took 24 hours to get to that image. You know? And then, and now I understand why I was using it. But it can only be made. And I suppose using your, me using my own body in that way is, is for me, makes the work deeply authentic. Um, in that I am not representing anybody else. I'm not trying to represent anybody else's experience or inhabit or evoke. It's entirely my own experience. And it's also about um, eliminating and, and, and um, liberating my, myself from my experience because I just become matter. You know, it has nothing to do with my ego. That is not the place where art is made. We all have egos. You know, someone was talking recently about artists' egos and being really tired of them. You know, they look, they, see, they want attention all the time. Why do they need so much attention? You know, looking, looking at them. No, that is not the case. It's actually the getting rid of the ego. This is what you learn in art college. It's how to lose your ego and how to become id, you know, the place of ideas. This is where you go so that you're, all those things inform your work and for your personality and our histories inform our work. And, and I completely acknowledge that. But in order for the final artwork to be made, you know, so much has to be processed and lost and given over to the artwork if, in order for it to then have a life of its own. You know, it's not about me. I'm not even interested in my own history. You know, why would, or any, you know, are my opinions about anything? But I'm very interested in how art can transcend all of that. And um, but coming back to chapel spaces, I think um, Donna Haraway, she talks about a sacramental consciousness, that artists um, have access to this. If you have the kind of upbringings we had, like Irish Catholic, religious, semi-military, disciplined, <laughs> um, um, investment into the young body uh, in order for it to perform well, you know, for the upholding of the imperial order or the church order or the state, whichever is the order that needs bodies in order for it to perform and succeed indefinitely into the future on its agenda. Well, we're not like that. We can't do it. We can, it's like... Just the body just resists at all times. And we're bacterially, you know, at a bacterial level that we were saying earlier. It's molecular. Um, our push to an alternative way of being in the world. Yeah, it's funny because uh, when you say then not ego, I, I do think about, not about ego, I think about my story, but not as something personal, exactly. as in my story, I, or our, for example, yeah. our history, I look at it as, a, as an example, a way to kind of think mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. other bigger forces that are being worked out. So kind of gene genealogies that are being played out. DNA inheritances that are passing through. And, and I do think passing through, like I'm kind of one moment of this coming together of different influences and it's going to pass through me and be passed on to other people. And in a way, the performance bit, the kind of sharing, the wanting attention is actually just about passing it on and passing through yeah. rather than it being a focus on the ego. It's just seeing this as a... Mm. a particular manifestation of whether they're cultural, psychic, spiritual energies that are in this form for a bit. Mm. And, and the kind of, I'm interested, I guess, in those forces have very many different manifestations. Some of them are 
hegemonic. Some of them are like the ones that are most acceptable or authorized. And there are these other expressions. And I think we are part of those other, we, well, we're part of all of it. We don't escape from the being all of the big forces yeah. and their hegemonic things, but we also express some alternatives. And it's funny, you're, you were talking about um, the body being trained. When I think back, um, I grew up in the countryside and I live in London. I live in like, I do a lot of work in urban environments, in situations of regeneration. So in fact, when we were here, all of this was a building site. So I had kind of church, I had all of that, but also this thing about, I mean, and I'm not gonna say neoliberal, whatever, but like regeneration and part of that development and all of those sort of bigger economic forces that are at play when something like this is possible. But I think my creativity comes from playing in the fields, from going off on my own, from green spaces, and I'm always looking for like little hidey holes and under hedges and splashing in the stream. And that has a real physical, like it has a sensation about what that might feel like on my skin, mm -hmm. but also the climbing, the clambering, the squelching, that's a really, I, I bring that, that that's part of the, the history that comes into these environments. Mm. Um, and in a way that feels more not human, it's about animals, it's about plants, it's about that other lichen, sort of queer lichen, queer ways of thinking about a body that isn't just its ego form, but is a whole set, like you said, of energies that can, can mm -hmm. kind of come and go in many different forms. And in a way, I feel the privilege that I have as an artist is that I get to explore that in ways that I kind of want to remind everyone that they are allowed to. It's just that the, the way that life is structured might not be giving them those opportunities. Mm. I, I feel really lucky that I found dance as a way that gave me permission, mm -hmm. like a form, a, an economic form, a cultural form, to explore possibilities that not everyone feels that they have the space mm -hmm. to do. And within dance, um, who would you look to? Who would have influenced you, or can, can you say? I'm I, just curious. Ironically, the influence when I was coming into dance, one of the reasons, I think I, I always wanted to be expressive. I couldn't be a writer because I studied literature at university, and whenever I would write anything, I would, the critical part of my brain would already be analyzing it, would already say, oh, well, someone else has done that and they've done it better, mm. or you're just pastiching someone else. So there was a critical thing. I felt a little bit the same about visual art. Like I was really mm -hmm. interested, mm -hmm. but I kind of knew it already. And in a way, when I came to dance, I didn't know anything. I had no reference points. It was just a kind of experience. Mm. And when I started making dance and doing dance, there was a naivety, but that it was actually very liberating. Yeah. Of course, now I know, like I know that I was doing things that I had learned mm. or learned somewhere. But because I was so trained to be so heady, I, I needed some place where it felt like, oh, this is, doesn't involve any critical, like having mm. to know the history and like prove a thing or footnote it or anything like that. So when you talk about, ref like I didn't have, I didn't have influences at that point. My influences would have been something like Beckett. Okay. Beckett, who I'd studied, because Beckett is so much about the body, about a body under pressure, whether it's just that lip that you see in the darkness of not I, it's those bodies in a trash can, it's the almost live art walking up and down of Rockaby and one, other ones like that. Okay. Um, a body really constrained and so there's a lot of words, but actually what's really happening is it's a body responding in the darkness. And certainly in the beginning, when I was making work, that was how I felt, uh, a body in the darkness. Mm -hmm. I felt very much on my own, kind of trying to mm -hmm. find this expression against what felt like the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Yeah, I identify very much with with that and my waking up to live art as a as a as a medium. Um, because yeah, being so aware of I love art history and I, I, I'm steeped in it, and so I'm very aware um, of the historical. But I had no history and no training at all at live art except it was drawing me, and and maybe liberation is something we might be talking about here because it was very freeing to just become a sculpture, you know, um, and hold that moment and in real time and, and space. And then that also, I suppose, is, um, historically live art is a reaction to, uh, came out of a reaction to consumerism and it's, a, uh, it's, it's energy is about, it's, it's um, brief, you know, um, uh, moment and that it's non, um, it's not sellable, it's not uh, repeat, it's, you can't read, it's not really repeatable. Um, so they're, they're very liberating things, you know, when you're trained in a very traditional kind of art, um, Product making, product heading towards that in a way. It's a, it's one of the main things that's you know um, that's there. It's like well, there you have something at the end that you can say, do you want to buy that? Uh, whereas with live art, it's very much close to dance. It's like yeah. it's there and then it's just gone, and everybody's had an experience together. We've all done it. We've all made it happen. The hours that I was here those first hours doing this 24-hour piece, uh, any time there was no one here, it was excruciatingly hard because there's no energy. It was just whatever bit of energy I had. I you know, plenty of it, but it was not even interesting to me because, you know, like coming back to it, it's not about me at all. It's like, I'm just making an image here. It doesn't exist if nobody sees it. It was nice to be live on YouTube, <laughs> but... Um, that's, that's crucial. So that coming back again to our Sunday morning here, you know, and these are all the things that can happen, I suppose, in a live event where the body is central, it's non-verbal, and um, we're kind of getting right down to the essence of, of being alive, really, in that moment, and feeling me feeling sedentary as you move and, you know, hungry or not, or tired or awake. And, and the, the, that in itself is so, is, is enough. It's, it, that's a lot to be just aware. Well, I, like, when you sat, you sat over there, the orientation was, was sort of that way. You sat over there, I'd seen you from behind for kind of, I, around the corner, and I knew I was doing the performance for you. And sometimes it's only, like, even if it's a mm. big group, it's just to be able to direct it to someone. I knew your energy. I knew that you had come. Mm. And, like, without, I guess I sort of knew, I don't know, maybe you could have come in judgment, I, but I didn't feel that. I knew you'd come in support. Mm. And so there's something about, like, all of you that come today, there's something about the support, the energy when people, when people show up. Yeah. And it's not, they didn't, maybe they don't need to do anything more, but just show up. But it's creating a, because recently, you know, like I'm 54, I definitely know that I want to stay dancing. There was a moment during the pandemic or after the pandemic when I was in residency where I was thinking, oh, is this just for me? Like, is it a hobby? Am I doing it, is it for my own? After I performed here, I knew, no, something changes. Mm. Something changes for me. I know I can, when I do it with others, as in even with an audience, like it is about sharing it, about performing it, mm. rather than, because like particularly that work unreeling was about these lines of energy that go out and come back in. So it's not just about doing them, it's... Mm unspooling um, these large, and, and knowing that even a small molecule 
can send its energies out dis, in a dis, you know, to the distance, um, even if the, that kind of, it doesn't have to be a huge thing, it can just be one body. Mm. But it's an exchange. It's an exchange, yeah. Yeah, that's what's important. It's exchanging, for me, is exchanging ideas and uh, energies, definitely, and empathies. Um, you know. you um, just because you mentioned commodities and sort of the, how live art, in a way, is a sort of resistance to the producing commodities. Historically. Yeah, historically. Um, I know that you'd wanted to talk about residencies. Yeah. For me, one of the things that's been, for me, um, been so valu valuable about residencies is that they exist outside of the dance market. Because, of course, in dance, we, we do learn how to produce mm. from those, you know, fleeting moments. We learn how to produce a commodity that can be sold. Like, that's, that's the business. Mm. The residency moments throughout my career have been valuable because they're moments away from that. They're away from production. Mm. Um, and the kind of, the idea that you, the expectation around the production of the product. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, they make, like, I would always say, of course, they contribute because they're about enriching ideas, but they tend to be spaces of hospitality, a space that's held where, certainly for me as an artist, I get to just be with the ideas and to, to develop things, to follow things, not because I have to have produced something by the end of this month because there's a show and some people showing up. And I said, it's going to be called green, and it has to be about green. It's a space where I could today do something about green, but if later I go on a walk and I meet someone, and they're like, oh, yellow is really interesting, and then I, like, I can come back and do a whole thing about dogs tomorrow. Like, as in, the, the space is there with, mm. for me, in res the best residencies that I've done have been about spaces of possibility. And interestingly, can sometimes be not about what's in the studio. They can be about conversations that I have or walks that I do. I know that I've mentioned, like, my husband is not part of the art world. I realize that I've made my working, I live in London, I work a lot in Ireland, but also in other places. I think I go away to make work. I go away to kind of create the conditions. Okay. So it's not that, that headspace, and that's why the pandemic was really hard. I had no really interest hard. in making dances from my living room. It just, no. no, like, and there was like such a proliferation. And great for the people that could, but like for me, that was not a generative environment. My domestic, my home is a separate space. Mm -hmm. The going to residency is a kind of immersion, a clearing <laughs> away of the, uh, many of the kind of habits of my daily domestic life mm. and going, okay, what is here? Mm. And in a way, those habits, they might show up. Like everything really personal may come into the space, but it comes into a much clearer space where I get to look at it mm. and evaluate it and where I'm open to possibilities. So residencies are really valuable. I yeah, know they're, they're, they're fascinating. I did, I've done two residencies <laughs> yeah. last year. One was in Assisi, and where I, um, and I was a shared residency with my friend Eva Bovenzi. She came from San Francisco. We've done at least one residency together before, over 20 like, years we've done. We met on a residency, actually, in Spain. And then I did nothing, you know, for 10 years, then another residency, and that generates a whole other thing. So this was a CC, and it was post-pandemic, and Eva had known about this, and she, we said we'd apply for it, and we hadn't, she had not left California, like, for two years. So it was, everything was very heightened, but it was, it, it really functioned as a, as a, as a residency, as in, I think on day three of the residency, I made that drawing that Helena was talking about, which we will show it, you know, of uh, this figure with this mask and a tongue, OK? 
Okay. But, so I just sat down and did that drawing, and it directly came out of being on a residency where there was no expectation to do anything at all, except all we did was every single day for a month, we went to the Basilica and looked at frescoes. That's what we did. And um, then it started working at home, you know. But there was no expectation to do anything, but I really did want something to come out of it. And then Helena suggested that I do a residency as part of the exhibition at the Art Centre and in kind of in preparation for this experimental piece of work. Um, so I did, I was artist in residence in my own kitchen. <laughs> you know? And how did you create the conditions? How did you, how did Mentally, you know you were in residence? Mentally, yeah. yes. I was just saying, for, on, when do I, does my residency begin? Monday, okay. Yeah. So on Monday, it was like, there's something shifted, definitely. So I had these ideas because this, this drawing was going to be the center, and that green and gold you're talking about that's on the walls here. Um, I did remember it. Like, I knew when I was sitting here at your performance, this institutional pea green and gold trim, you know, entered into my consciousness and brain as the color of, you know, these buildings and the corridors we would have walked through in boarding school are green. Right. So to me, this color is very particular. It's not oppression, it's just loaded, you know. So I made this head, the head is this green color and this gold mask with the tongue. I suppose masks, this mask, not the eye mask, was, was what we lived with for so long. And the tongue for me, so it became the thing that came out of the residency, okay, um, which was totally new. So everything else I had pretty much planned. This was going to be a lunar event, you know. There's a volcano which I'm obsessed with. Um, and um, these other elements, like the music was really important, the sound, percussion, and slowing everything down for uh, an hour. And just taking 24 hours to repeat one thing. Um, just 20, we're in 24 hours now. We're in the next 24 hours, of the next 24 hours. So this is just trying to bring attention to that. But in the middle of all that, on my residency, um, I thought, how am I going to make this mask with this tongue? And I got some you know, uh, children's clay, just standard craft clay in the art supply. And I made the tongue. And I really liked making this tongue. So then I made a load of tongues. And um, then I had watercolor that I brought from Italy, very beautiful watercolor. So painting these tongues, and then I made this tongue resort over here, <laughs> where all the tongues were hanging out, yeah. So this was this little installation, micro-installation, that would never have happened without the residency, because there was no expectation. I had told nobody about the tongues. I just said, there may be tongues. <laughs> the, the tongue to me is so fascinating, because it's interior and exterior. It's the most fascinating organ. It's the organ of speech, of sex, of eating, of um, screaming of pain, you know, it's the thing that's cut off if you want to silence somebody. So the tongue is, you know, very fascinating to me. And also it's interior and exterior, you know, and, and that's, that's where we are negotiating that, that kind of space all the time. Being inside, here, um, and then leaving, being outside, so. What I'm really interested that you've spoken about, because you've performed here, and that's one of the things that are performing does is that the tongues are there in oh, the yes. same way that I remember you sitting there in the performance. Yes. I, yes. Can, I can remember my own dancing around these spaces. Yeah. And in a way, these performances help to create new histories in spaces that have mm. other kinds of histories kind of encoded in them really. Mm -hmm. All of our bodies have helped to make other histories possible. These sort of performances that you're doing are giving is giving is giving a possibility, is kind of creating another emotional, psychological architecture in the space. Yes. And and I would say one of the other things, it's funny the, when you were talking about um, it not being about you. 
I was sort of thinking, oh, do I feel the same? I think one of the things about performing, and particularly about dancing for me, is that it's a practice that makes me, like what I do, what I mm. practice every day, what we practice every day makes us. Mm. So I have to be careful because if I practice a military sort of, and you can be military about your yoga practice or about your ballet or about your, you know, whatever, you could be, you know, I could be, disciplining about mm -hmm. that. I, I have to be careful about whether I'm choosing to become that person or whether I am choosing to practice something that kind of amplifies possibility that allows me to keep exploring. And I feel like all I want to kind of invite everyone to that awareness and possibility to experience choices about who it is that we practice to be every day. And so when you spend 24 hours, and it's interesting, like when I talked to you, you talked about being kind of out of, like it was an out of time. It, it has a resonance. It has a resonance with the people that came to mm -hmm. see it. Mm -hmm. It changes something in the world. So it matters what you perform. Mm -hmm. It matters what you do because it makes this matter different yeah absolutely i agree and and this is this uh, this is a military chapel it's not no longer used but it has all its own all those histories here of people who walked up this aisle and got married here and children of military families army families baptized here no doubt and all those very important life events you know but these are also our lives are also important and our queerness is important and um, I and it's about including us in that stream of of life events really you know um, I was reading about this, um, this artist machine dazzle have you come across him in New York yeah and he talks about this thing called queer maximalism where it's everything is just what you're saying can we do this and can we bring your ego or your ideas and your histories and create something new, I think you can. I think that is what, um, I think that is what's happening in maximalism where you can be, or in the Baroque, you know, this is what I look, <laughs> I look towards, the Baroque art, where you can be completely shallow and completely profound at the same time, right? This is queer theory to me. You know, where you are saying absolutely nothing except kitsch, and you're saying something massively profound about trauma, you know, or experience at the same, exactly the same moment, or you're super visible and invisible, like a, like a, like a, a drag performer. You're, you're, you're totally there as you and all of your history, I would interpret. I certainly am, everything, and yet I'm not there at all. I'm just, a body without organs, as Deleuze says, you know, it's just, I'm just a neutral, completely neutral thing, and yet I'm everything. You're all, it's all happening at the same time, and that's kind of overwhelming. You know? It makes but, me think about your, the paintings in a way that um, everything is there, and also things are hidden. Like it's oh yes. vis visibility and hiddenness, that's, you're, you're layering those yes. things, you're hiding so, things as well as making other things much. even. But I suppose the empowering thing is that you're choosing what to show and you're choosing what to hide. And, and rather than being told what to be, what to hide, yeah. it's my cho choice to say what I'm going to reveal and what I'm going to keep hidden. And ultimately, I just want to make art.